Welcome to episode 33 of the Rescued by Dragons fantasy podcast, Tales of the Brunch Club. My name is Brian Mesmer, and I'm not only your storyteller, but the dungeon master behind the homebrew Dungeons & Dragons campaign the story is based on. Please join me as I tell the tale of how my players and the dice ruined and improved my perfectly laid plans. But first, a quick recap. In episode 32... The Brunch Club hadn't decided on letting Jory join them yet, but did invite him to spend the day with them to see if he'd be a good fit. They bought Salas some new clothes and equipment to finally replace what she'd lost when she was disintegrated. Diesa, Alora, and Jory entered a pit fighting tournament. Alora won a 200 gold prize for coming in third place. They celebrated at a local tavern where a group of pirates recognized Jory. Before Drusilla could negotiate a price for the halfling, Diesa broke a bottle on the table and attacked the pirates. One of them picked up Jory and tried to get away with him, but he was stopped by Salas. The brunch club left the tavern in a hurry and decided staying at the rampant wizard inn was no longer safe. And now, episode 33, Undercover Butler. Diesa entered the large single room the brunch club had rented at the Victorian Inn. It was crowded, but they hoped that renting only one room would disguise the fact that a group of five had checked in. She put the basket of fruit and bread on the small table in the middle of the room. Any sign of pirates out there? Salas asked. Not that I saw, Desa said as she peeled an apple with her knife. Were you followed back? asked Jory. Desa shot him a glaring look. Jory took that as a no. No one spoke while they ate breakfast. Jory... I want to apologize for the past couple days, Drusilla said when they'd finished eating. Horjan's death affected me more than I want to admit, and I know if he were here, he'd want us to help you. Yeah, agreed Alora. I was a bit mean to you too, and I can't really call myself a monster hunter if I become a monster, and I don't want to become what I hunt. Horjan was kind of our moral compass, agreed Salas. He gave his life for me... But he'd have given it for any of us. We owe it to him to try and be good. Um, exactly how good do you think he'd want us to be? Asked Diesa, wondering if being good meant she had to stop stealing shiny objects that caught her eye. Does this mean you're not going to dress me up like a little girl? Joy asked, hopefully. I'm not saying it's off the table, Drusilla smiled at him. But if someone has another idea... Let me give it a shot, Diesa said. She rummaged through her rucksack and pulled out a strip of rolled canvas. When she unrolled it, they could see it had pockets for makeup brushes, tubes of grease paint, and other items that made up a theatrical makeup kit. She told Joy to sit on the low coffee table in front of her, and she got to work. When she was done, Joy stood before them as an elderly halfling. His hair was gray and cut to make it look like it was thinning. His eyebrows were white and bushy. He had a scraggly chin beard and dark circles under his eyes. A rolled-up pillowcase in his shirt gave his belly a little paunch. They were all impressed by the transformation. Mm, something's still missing, Drusilla said, though she couldn't identify what it was. I think I know, Jory said. He borrowed Salas's staff and held it like a walking stick. He bent forward slightly and began using the staff to walk gingerly around the room. He said in a strained, shaky voice, Hello there, my name's Jerry. Jerry Attrick. It's nice to see young people these days taking an interest in adventuring. Why, back in my day... Diesa threw a piece of bread at him to make him stop. Now it's perfect, Drusilla said. Jory bowed, taking credit for his performance. Who's the young halfling playing dress-up? Asked a voice that belonged to no member of the brunch club. They all leapt to their feet and pointed their weapons at the cloaked figure who suddenly stood in the small room with them. She pulled her hood back from her face. The brunch club relaxed and put their weapons away. Jory stood wide-eyed and amazed. Solania, he said with star-struck reverence. Solania made herself as comfortable as she could in the cramped room. They offered her the room's only chair and she accepted. The rest of them sat on the two beds, except for Diesa. She stood leaning against the door with her arms crossed. They started to tell her what happened in the crypts beneath the ruins of the old Raven Queen Temple, but she stopped them, offering to wait until Vorjan joined them. She looked genuinely sad when they told her what happened to Vorjan. She also looked disappointed. 
After a moment's pause, she bade them to tell her what happened. An undead beholder. That is unusual, said Solania when they'd finished their tale. She also told them that the room guarded by the magical suits of armor was the tomb of the great warrior Siridin Hindel. The guards were animated constructs known as helmed horrors, created specifically to guard Hindel's resting place. She thanked them for uncovering the source of the undead and killing the beholder. She told Drusilla she could keep the license to use divine magic while in Elnor, but asked her to only use it when absolutely necessary. She also told them that she would start the process of getting them access to the library. She looked as though she was about to share something with them, but then stopped and rose to leave. Solania, Drusilla asked, what did you want to use Forjon for? Yeah, we know about the note that you had given to him at Lady Tyrol's, Salas said. Solania sat back down. She thought about where to begin and decided to start at the beginning. Centuries ago, Elnor is ruled by a triumvirate of powerful clerics. Magic users such as myself and Salas were considered abominations and hunted as heretics. The clerics, with no one to check their power, became corrupt and the citizens of Elnor suffered. Eventually, a group of five powerful mages began a secret teaching college where they taught other gifted people the arcane arts. They also rallied the oppressed people, and together they overthrew the triumvirate. Those five mages were the original Council of Five. They tore down all the temples, banished the clerics, and made divine magic illegal inside the city walls. They took their mage college out of the shadows and invited anyone around the world to study there. They took every book, scroll, journal, and sketchbook from all the temples and used them to start the Crystal Spire Library's vast collection. It ushered in the golden age of arcane magic and made Elnor the education capital of the world. But just like the clerics of old, without anyone to check their power, the Council of Five eventually became as corrupt as the triumvirate they had overthrown. Once again, the common people suffered. I want to restore the clerics to Elnor and reshape the government to one ruled by clerics, wizards, and common citizens. Vorjan told me he'd help, but now that he's gone... Her voice trailed off. The look of disappointment once again appeared on her face. Why can't we help you? Drusilla asked. I am a cleric of the Raven Queen, and I would like to see her temple restored to its former glory. He took a death ray for me, I'm in, said Salas. Mm, sounds like fun, Alora added. So... How exactly are we supposed to help you? Deasa said, sounding unimpressed. We got our asses kicked by a horror Mazda and lost one of our own to a rotting beholder. How are we supposed to take on a bunch of power-hungry wizards? Jory looked appalled. Don't talk to Solania that way, he scolded Deasa. The rogue rolled her eyes at him and waited for Solania's answer. She's right, Solania said, agreeing with the surly rogue. I would never ask you to take on Ilian and his supporters. Ugh, I knew Ilion was a creep, scoffed Alora. Solania smiled and continued. I need you to find someone for me, a wise old hermit named Calivar. He's very powerful and could help check the council's power while a new government is formed. He may not be willing to help, though, so I need you to convince him on my behalf. Desa cracked her knuckles. I think we can convince him. How do we find him? asked Drusilla. He lives on a rocky island 20 miles east of here. The waters are treacherous, but it's a day's sail if you leave early enough. There's a boat named the Damsel at the docks. Captain Butler is expecting you tonight so he can set sail with the tide before dawn. Is there anything you can tell us that might help us convince him? Salas asked. A gift for him is already on the ship. When you present it to him, tell him, The foundation of Elnor continues to crumble. Solania has upheld her end of the agreement and humbly asks your assistance in setting Elnor right. They all agree that they would help and would be on the damsel that evening. Ugh, great, another ship, Joy muttered, but agreed to go along. Solania thanked them and again gave her condolences for the fallen Vorjan before disappearing through a portal. The sun was setting as they walked through the port district. They could hear the creaking of masts, the hum of wind through an infinite number of ropes, and the call of gulls circling the docks, looking for scraps. Joy noticed a larger number of gulls on the boardwalk nearby. They were circling above the open-air market. I'll be right back, he told his companions as he hobbled quickly away, committing to his geriatric disguise. 
He returned a few minutes later, a large burlap sack slung over his shoulder. It almost touched the ground, and he was struggling to carry it. Give me that, Deasa said, as she grabbed the sack and flung it over her shoulder with ease. Thank you, Joy said. Don't look inside. It's a surprise. Deasa grunted and then continued to the damsel. They announced who they were, and Captain Butler invited them aboard. The captain was average height for a human. He was clean-shaven and had close-cropped hair and brown eyes. He had the face of a sailor exposed to years of sun and salt water. I recognize you, Alora exclaimed when they reached the deck. You're the bartender that gave Vorjan the note at Lady Tyrol's party, she then added in a quieter, more conspiratorial tone. Captain Butler bowed, who replied, At your service. What's that? Salas asked. She pointed at what appeared to be an elf-sized statue wrapped in quilted blankets and rope being loaded onto the ship. I believe that's what you're supposed to deliver, Captain Butler told them. Come, let me show you to your cabins. Can you point me to the galley? asked Jory. The boat was underway and well out of Elnor's harbor when the brunch club gathered on the deck in the morning. There was no sign of Jory. They noticed the crew were all smiling, most had mugs with steam visible from their hot contents. Some were holding plates, or had empty plates next to them. Captain Butler approached them. He smiled. Thank you for sharing your cook with us. This is the best breakfast our crew has had in a long time. We don't have a cook. We usually just take turns, but now I think I might have to spend the money for one. Hi, guys, Joy said behind them. He was out of his geriatric disguise and holding a tray. It had four mugs and four plates of what looked like waffles, but they were orange. Want some pumpkin waffles? That sounds weird, said Diesa, but they all tried some. These are delicious, Drusilla said. Oh, so good, agreed Alora. Better than I was expecting, offered Diesa, who then asked, what's in the mugs? I call it pumpkin spice foamy coffee, Joy said proudly. Even though no one asked, he began a detailed description of the recipe. The tricky part is rapidly whisking the milk over a low fire to make it frothy before it burns. The hot drink tasted like pumpkin pie. It was especially enjoyable in the cool, brisk ocean air that blew across the deck. Ugh, gross, gagged Diesa. This tastes like a toddler's drink. Some people don't like it, Joy admitted. I guess there's no accounting for taste. I'll go get you some black coffee. They stood on the deck, sipping their coffee, waiting for the island to appear on the horizon. Salas took out her scroll of fine familiar and sat on the deck. As she read it, they saw the familiar sight of the letters glowing, then burning away. When she was done, a small white pygmy owl stood in the ashes. <gasps> Where are we? What the hell happened in that tomb? I thought we died! Pip looked around him nervously, trying to adjust to its sudden surroundings. It's okay, Salas said in a soothing voice. We're fine. Pip looked up at Joy. Who's the short one? That's Jory, she said, then finished the introduction. Jory, this is Pip. What's going on? Jory asked, visibly confused. Uh, this is Salas's familiar, explained Drusilla. He understands us and can talk, but only Salas can hear him. Wow, said Jory, you guys are so cool. Hey, wait a second, Pip said to Salas as he swiveled his head from side to side. Where's the big dumb dragonborn? Salas told Pip everything that had happened, and how Vorjan gave his life to save him. Pip stared at her and said nothing. His beak quivered. His eyes watered. I can't believe he's gone! He wailed. Tears streamed down his feathers. He buried his face in Salas's shoulder and wept. There, there, Salas said softly as she gently patted on his back. The brunch club sat on deck. The island had become visible on the horizon, but the headwinds were causing them to have to tack and jive rather than make for it in a straight line. The progress was agonizingly slow. Pfft, sailing's boring, Alora observed. Yeah, Joy agreed. They don't sing about this part in the ballads. The group said nothing for a few moments as the wind breezed across the deck. Every minute, their vessel crawled slowly towards their destination. A sudden lurch of the boat caught them off guard, causing them to almost fall over. They felt the wind pick up, waves crash against the hull on both sides, and sent water spraying over the deck. This doesn't feel right, Joy said. The worried look on his face concerned the others. They stood up and fastened the safety lines around their waists. The waves pummeled the boat even faster now, and the wind whirled around them. Captain Butler called for the sails to be furled in. The last sailor was climbing down from the mast when he was hit by a wave that knocked him across the deck. Whoa, 
Did you see that wave? Deasa shouted over the roar of the ocean. That's not a wave, Captain Butler said, coming up behind him. His shirt was off, revealing a well-muscled torso, which Alora approved of. The water that had splashed across the deck pooled together and rose up in the form of a large humanoid. It had no legs, but moved around the deck easily on a column of water. It had large arms and hands which it used to pick up the day's crewman and slam him down into the deck head first, breaking his neck with a sickening snapping noise. The brunch club drew their weapons. Captain Butler drew a scimitar that seemed to glow and shimmer. It's a water elemental, he said. They're hard to kill. Magic works best, he told them as he raised his sword and charged. Alora's phoenix arrow beat him to the creature. Steam hissed from its front and back as the arrow seared through it returned to Alora's quiver. Captain Butler sliced an arm off the watery beast, fell to the deck, and collapsed into a large puddle. Drusilla called forth a sacred flame on the creature. It gurgled and seemed to arch back in pain as the steam poured off it. It swung wildly with its remaining arm and knocked Captain Butler off his feet. Then it charged Drusilla and punched her in the chest with a fist the size of her torso. The cleric grunted with pain but managed to keep her feet. Salas fired several magic missiles into the beast. The surface tension that bound the water in its elemental form seemed to shake and tear apart. Jory saw his chance and kicked it twice. He followed the kicks with two quick punches which were enough to reduce it to a harmless puddle. Another wave crashed over the side of the boat and morphed into a second elemental. It attacked Drusilla with another powerful blow to her chest which knocked her unconscious. She looked immediately pale. The others knew she'd been critically wounded. Deasa, Jory, help Drew, we'll hold it off, shouted Alora as she sunk two more phoenix arrow shots into the creature. Will fire do more damage to it? Salas asked the captain as she raised her hands. Please do not conjure fire on my boat, implored Butler as he charged the creature. Good, good point, said Salas. She fired another volley of magic missiles at the water elemental. It staggered back upon impact. Jory held Drusilla's head up while Deasa poured a healing potion into her mouth. She coughed and sat up. Ugh, thanks, I needed that, she said. Alora and Salas hit the water elemental again, wounding it enough for Captain Butler to finish it off with a final swing with a scimitar. They all got in defensive positions, waiting for the next elemental to appear, but none did. The waves calmed down, and the wind returned to a gentle breeze. Our tale will continue in episode 34. Episode 33 was written by Dominic White and myself, Brian Mesmer. The story is based upon my own homebrew Dungeons & Dragons campaign. Additional role-playing contributions to the story by Bethany Powers, who played Deasa, J.P. Black, who plays Drusilla, Liz Richard, who plays Alora, Anna Flemke, who plays Salas, and Dominic White, who plays Jory. Ambience and effects used with permission by Michael Gelfie. If you enjoyed this podcast, please help us out by sharing it with your friends. We'd really appreciate it. More information about Rescued by Dragons and ways to support this podcast can be found at rescuedbydragons.com. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Rescued by Dragons, on Twitter at Rescue Dragons, and on YouTube under Rescued by Dragons. Thank you for listening, and please join me next week to see what my players' choices and the roll of the dice have in store.